grade 12 learners to Introduction to Philosophy of the Human Person. Once again, this is your teacher, Mom M. Magdadao. You join me today as we are going to discuss our lesson, Week 4, Lesson 4, Human Person and the Society. The focus of this discussion is in MELK 4, to realize that intersubjectivity requires accepting differences and not imposing on others. At the end of this discussion, you are expected to recognize how individuals form societies and how individuals are in transformed, are transformed by societies. Second, compare different forms of societies and individualities. And the third, explain how human relations are transformed by social systems. So from our previous discussion, we learned about situated freedom. So situated freedom means that our choices in life depends on a given situation. So based on this idea, the two types of freedoms were derived. The first type of freedom is what we call the freedom of choice or the horizontal freedom. And the other one is the fundamental option or a vertical freedom. Now, knowing the freedom of choice, it's a basic and particular choice that we make every day in our lives. While the fundamental option is our general direction or orientation in life that reflects our values in life. So we learn also in our previous lesson, when we make our decisions, we learned also from our previous discussion that we base our decisions on a high moral standards that along with our freedom of choices comes with the responsibility and accountability on the results of our actions. Let's try to go over with some of the questions in your pretest, and we're going to answer some of them. The first question, who each of the following stated that friends are two bodies with one soul? A. Plato B. Aristotle C. Democritus D. Thales And the correct answer is Letter B. Aristotle Which is the year when the beginning of Reformation started? A. 1452 B. 1453 C. 1517 Or letter D. 1520 And the correct answer is Letter B. 1453 They sacked and pillage the declining Western Roman Empire. Letter A, the French Scouts, B, the Turkish Barbarians, C, the German Barbarians, or letter D, the German. And the answer is letter C, the German Barbarians. Number four, in his reign, Christianity began to lift Europe from the Dark Ages where many barbarians become Christians. A, Charmelaine, B. Constantine, C. Claudius, and D. Clovis. And the answer is letter D. Clovis. Number five, it is a doctrine that holds conviction that the Son of God is finite. And created by God the Father, and thus condemned as hearsay by the Church. A. Aryan believed. B. Atheist believed. C. Reformist believed. And D. And D. Pagan believed. And the correct answer is letter D. Pagan believed. Next question. In his reign, Christianity widens. So, who do you think? Which do you think among these people are subjected to this description? A. Claudius B. Constantine C. Charmelaine and letter D. Clovis The correct answer is letter C. Charmelaine Number 8, the last question The way of life in the Middle Ages is called A. Anarchism B. Paganism C. Scantism Scantilism and D. Feudalism And the correct answer is letter D. Feudalism. So you are going to do activity one and the direction says explain how these institutions have transformed and improved your way of living. So you're going to explain it in a narrative form. Like in number one, how do you think your house or family transform you or improve your way of living? 
or maybe number two, which is the school, or number three, your institutions or government sectors. And number four, explain what are the possible factors of society's continuous transformation. And the last question is, are the people fully responsible whatever transformation societies has gone through? Why or why not? So as time goes by, life has become more complicated. Formerly, we know life was much simpler. As we look around us, we can see how technology has evolved over time. So from the medieval period to the Industrial Revolution, it was dominated by factors such as revolutionary discoveries in natural sciences, detection, and extraction of energy resources, invention of mechanical devices, availability of investment capital, improved means of transportation, communication, and growing interests as taken by scientific and commercial circles in technology and engineering. So we all know philosophically our totality, our wholeness, our complete life relies on our social relations. So what do you think drives the human being to establish society? We all know that human beings know that they exist to relate with others. And by nature, a human being is a social being. And third, he or she is a person with varied that should have the varied relationship, that should need variety of relationship in order to shape him as a person. And establishing a society would also expand his or her horizons. It could also establish friendship and it could deal with other figures of authority. So defining society. Some may say a society is an organized group of people whose members interact frequently and have common territory and culture. Yes, that could be one. Or a society could be a form of companionship or friendly association with others. Or to some, it's an alliance, a union, or a community. And to others, human influence society through actions or provides opportunities to further growth in the coming years. What is the reason why we should build this what we call society? Commonly, we have to achieve a certain purpose or goal. Number one, our desire to achieve the goal of survival. So we survive when we relate with other people, when we have one another. Number two, united and work together because of the natural desire for goodness. Another common reason, it refers to social conditions which enables persons and groups to fulfill their goals and achieve well-being. And of course, for the purpose of peace and order, for clean and safe public spaces, or maybe efficient transport system or efficient public services. So there are different forms of societies that have evolved over time. Like when the first people started, they had this what we call hunting and gathering form of society. Where the earliest, it was the earliest and the simplest, the nomadic, and the members were treated all equally. Next is the pastoral society where there is domestication of animals for more stable food and supply, and there is trade with other societies and engagement in handicrafts. The third type or form is the horticultural society. So it's a small-scale cultivation and domestication where there was semi-nomadic and the task assigned according to gender, often very family and clan-oriented only. And commonly, they are bound or restricted by tradition. Next up, another form of society is the agrarian or agricultural society. So this has improved technology and there is the use of tools to aid in farming or structured social systems that often lead to conflict because it is becoming more and more complex. And here comes the feudal society or feudalism. 
So there was ownership of the land and the vassal loyal to his lord and served by the peasants which are, represents the workers and the higher class which are treated with respect with the lower classes. Next up is the industrial society. During this period were specialized machineries, more innovations, transportations and communications, and capitalism was present. The next form of society is the post-industrial society. So this is based on knowledge or the information and sales services led by human mind, aided by highly technology, and the members living in this type of society are having already a higher educational attainment. And last up is the virtual society, which is our present society. So this aided with technology and the internet, and the human person still remains in the heart of the society as he or she drives the social changes. So Aristotle once also shared that a friend is a single soul dwelling in two bodies. So when two people are having their social relationship, they are like into one single soul which are represented by different bodies. And for Martin Boover, the human person also attains fulfillment in the realm of the interpersonal or in meeting the other through a genuine dialogue. So there is what we call conversation when you try to relate with one another in the society. And of course, from Pope John Paul II, that through participation, we also share in the humanness of others. So no man is an island. We all need one another and we have to participate. There is what we call the give and take relationship from one person to the other. So how do you think human relations are transformed by social systems when it comes to knowledge, laws, economy, and technology? Starting off with new knowledge. Socrates once said that knowledge is virtue while ignorance is vice. So to him, this is the summation of what he wants to teach about human beings, about how human beings should live in a good life. He says that ignorance is an opposite of knowledge and it's the source of evil because humanity commits evil when they when people do not know any better. Like if you don't have any knowledge, then you are not properly guided on what to choose and you tend to commit mistakes and you tend to go the wrong way because you lack of knowledge. The origins of modern age may be seen in the phenomenal growth of knowledge that can be traced to the revival of the Greek science. So at first it was very slow and with a rapid quickening of pace after the 15th century, the humanity has met with increasing success in understanding the secrets of nature and even applying this new knowledge to human affairs. Well, in the 20th century, this expansion has been so rapid that the local knowledge no longer remains purely local and accepted systems of knowledge in specialized fields have been overturned within a single generation. So this process of intellectual growth is continuing without any slackening of pace and changes in our understanding in the years ahead may be well greater than those that we have seen in our own lifetime. How about in policy making? So at present, one of the most important consequences in the application of this new knowledge to human affairs has been increased in the integration of policy making. So like in the private realm, systems of transportation, communication, business and education have tended to become larger and more centralized. So most communications at the national level have become unified and many are now organized on a worldwide basis. And governments in the public realm have also increasingly tended to accumulate functions formally performed by the province only, or even district, tribe, or family. So even the most tyrannical governments in earlier times did not have the degree of control over individual that is now normally exercising by governments in advanced societies. So as life has become more complex, 
The legal system has also grown to the point where almost all human activities come in contact with the law in one form or another. And sometimes there is a danger that we're going to lose our human rights. So this integration of policy making has brought people within the states into unprecedentedly closer relationship and has resulted in a greater complexity of social organizations. Thirdly is the economic sphere. So the effects of knowledge also or new knowledge have been partially experienced or noticeable in the economic sphere like because of some technical improvements there is a possibility of more mechanization of labor that will also result to mass production and a rapid growth in per capita productivity and of course the increasing division of labor so when there is a greater quantity of goods that has been produced in the entire preceding period of human history and the contrast of today between the level of living in relatively modern centuries and that in traditional societies is very normal. So a greater quantity of goods has been produced during the past century in the entire preceding period of human history. Now the contrast of today is between the level of living in relatively modern century and in the traditional society. That you can experience a lot of results already or you can observe a lot of changes because of the growing economy as time goes by and the social realm so equally important are the changes that have taken place in the social realm so traditional societies are typically closed and rigid in their structure and the members of such society are primarily peasants living in a relatively isolated villages poor and illiterate and having little contact with the central political authorities now, the way of life of the peasants may remain virtually unchanged for centuries. Now, in the modern knowledge and technology, the modern knowledge and technology has already an immense impact on the traditional way of life. So, in a modern society, two thirds of more of the population lives already in the cities, and literacy is virtually universal, which means it's homogenic society. Now, people already depend on the individual achievements more than the inherited status. And last is the technology. The more society is influenced by technology, the more we need to consider the social, ethical, technological, technological, and scientific aspects of each decision and choice. So this will require the capability to consider and evaluate the standards employed in the choice and implementation of scientific research and technological development in relation to the aspirations of the people. So the ability to evaluate the products of science and technology in relation to culture and value as well as the aspiration of the nation is very significant and this needs to be nurtured and developed through social and cultural education. Science and technology has greatly influenced the human existence and has become essential to humanity. Heidegger once said that there is a need of a meditative thinking or philosophical reflection in order to reconsider this connection. Technology has become a reflection of nature itself. Success in the advancement of technology is faced by the inability and lack of humanistic knowledge to answer or address poverty, ignorance, famine, which undermine the position, the position of human science and effects to develop. It can be admitted in the modern time today that success can be measured in mastering science and technology. Technology has saved the liberated individuals or human beings from ignorance, thus become a symbol of autonomy. Let us remember that science and technology were originally created in order to liberate people and to help them or assist them in solving their problems. And if it goes beyond our control, it can give us destruction. It could destroy our lives, our environment, lose our sensitivity, even lose our spiritual contact with God. So whether our social orientation has evolved or technology has become the biggest part of our lives, let us not forget that God gave us wisdom and knowledge not for us to be destroyed, but for us to live harmoniously with one another 
living a life with a purpose. Ryan Herbert once shared that the capacity to learn is a gift and the ability to learn is a skill. So the willingness to learn is always a choice. So I hope you always choose to learn something new. And thank you for being with me today in this learning episode. So I'll see you all in our next learning video.